My name is Monica Jean, and I'm a field crops educator located in the Saginaw Bay region. And I am pleased to announce that Marty Chilvers is here this morning to talk to us about wheat foliar disease and head scab management. All right, Marty. Marty and guest, you good? All right. Yes. Good to roll. Thanks, Monica. Good morning, everybody. Um, so let's jump straight into thinking about wheat disease management um, with a bit of an emphasis on head scab. Um, so let's just chat really quickly about foliar diseases. So there are a lot of diseases that can, you know, impede maximum yields or, or hurt our yield potential. Um, some of those, uh, you know, these are sort of the common ones, powdery mildew, septoria, stag, uh, stripe rust and leaf rust. Um, over the last couple of years, we've seen some powdery mildew and most of these diseases are also very variety dependent. Um, so this is something really important to, to remember that if you have a variety that's um, susceptible to, to powdery mildew, for example, you really need to, to know about that. Uh, with the wet and cool weather that we've had, uh, powdery, powdery mildew um, is not a problem. It really prefers those dry conditions. Uh, the spores that powdery mildew produces tend to burst open uh, with rainfall. Um, the other thing that was an issue uh, back in 2016 in particular is stripe rust. So we keep an eye on this disease. This is a, um, it's a rust and it, it needs that living host. And so what tends to happen is it moves from the south to the north um, most year or every year. Um, 2016 was just a situation where we had a lot of those rust spores blowing in and, um, you know, the, the epidemic developed into you know, levels that really did hurt our wheat yields. So just another one to sort of keep uh, an eye on. That's something that, that I'm watching for. And um, as things pop up, we'll, we'll let you know. <clears throat> Excuse me. So before I launch into some of the head scab discussion, let's talk a little bit about fungicides and disease control. Um, timing is everything for optimizing disease control and protecting yields. Um, we did have some conversations with people about they were making those early applications, was there value or not? So we ran some analyses um, across some, some data sets that we had, and, and I'll walk you through the data. So what we basically are going to talk about here is, is three sort of general timings. Those early timings at FEEX 5 to 6. Um, on campus here in Lansing, we've just hit uh, FEEX 6 now where we can feel that, that node. Uh, but we made applications uh, last week when we were at that FEEX 5 growth stage for some of the trial work that we're doing. Uh, another really important timing to consider um, is that T2 timing. That's important if we're thinking about trying to protect that flag leaf. Um, sometimes we can wait until that flowering timing to get that application on and give us some, some good protection of that flag leaf. Um, unless disease is really ramping um, earlier, we might need that, that spray to be earlier. But the last timing is at T3, and that's, that's thinking about flowering. And that's really thinking about head scab um, suppression. So what we did then is ran what we call meta-analyses. We pulled data from Martin Nagelkirk up in the thumb, uh, Kurt Steinke's group, and then our group here on campus, and pulled um, a number of different studies together to have a look at the yield uh, responses. So we looked at 93 different studies from Michigan, and this is the general yield response. So this is always going to be the case, right? There's going to be some that, that um, happen to be um, below your non-treated, um, some above. But by and large, most were positive um, and statistically beneficial. But What's really important is to start looking at, at those timings. You can see that the, um, the timings that included a T3 or a T2 timing, um, either you know, at flag leaf or at flowering, tended to be the most uh, prof or most beneficial in terms of yield protection um, compared to the non-fungicide treated. The T1 timings, there are a couple that, that are you know, somewhat beneficial, but they tend to sort of be back on the, on the lower end of the responses. Just looking at these um, on average, um, this is what we saw. And honestly, I was a little bit surprised and I'll show you um, some data to counter this in just a second. But that T1, that FIX 5-6 application around about now, you know, potentially with a herbicide application, 
we saw an average of four bushel response. I think we really need to dig into this a little bit more and understand why that may have been the case. And I'll, and I'll show you some data for that in a minute. Um, the T2 at flag leaf was just under seven bushel. The T3 at flowering, about seven and a half bushel. The combination early and flag, about 10 and a half bushel. So that's across um, multiple years um, and multiple locations here in Michigan. Um, so again, that, that early timing, I was just surprised at the size of the response. So I did, did so, have had some discussions with other people. This is something that the Ontario group um, were just tweeting about um, the other day. And they were only seeing about a one and a half bushel response from that T1 timing. So although I'm showing you data here that showed, you know, a four bushel response on average, um, you know, take that with a pinch of salt. Um, the Ontario folk only saw one and a half bushel. So we need to dig into that a little bit more to understand what's going on. But it would point out the T2, T3 timings, very similar to our data sets, somewhere in that seven, eight, nine bushel response. Um, on average. And this is across different varieties. You know, there's a whole bunch of factors into that. But keep in mind that timing is everything. So I mentioned that stripe rust epidemic of 2016, and here's a great photo from that. So we've got a non-treated check that received no fungicide. And next to it here, a plot that received a fungicide at that flag leaf timing. So this is a situation if you'd bought into like, let's just spray early and then at flowering, that wouldn't have worked for that stripe rust epidemic. You really had to have protection on the flag leaf. Um, you know, that, that, you know, it's been like eight years now since, since that happened, that really severe epidemic, but we need to be mindful um, of conditions and maybe adjust plans accordingly. So just really brief summarizing that. So the largest yield protection typically comes from fungicide or plague to flag leaf and all the flowering timing. <laughs> Obviously the application at flowering also provides some protection from head scab, which is really helpful. Um, those early fungicide apps, really interesting, but I think we need to do a bit more work to understand that. And we're working with Kurt Steinke at the moment, looking at different nitrogen rates um, and fungicide response, trying to pull that apart a bit more. The other thing I do want to mention is multiple fungicide applications certainly do increase the risk of fungicide resistance. Um, and the folks in Europe really struggle with fungicide resistance. They've got a lot of issues going on uh, due to the multiple applications that they use. Uh, results will also vary by you know, wheat variety, year and location. And those fungicide plans may need to change based on the disease conditions that are present. And again, at the moment, uh, in the scouting that I've done, I haven't seen a great deal of disease. Um, it's just been really too cool uh, for much of those diseases to really develop. Okay, let's talk about the other part of this, um, head scab. Um, so that likes warm and wet conditions. So if we get warm and wet conditions during flowering, that's gonna you know, really help to promote um, head scab. So this head scab, pathogen, the Fusarium graminearum, is also a pathogen of corn. And so it can survive on um, corn residue, release spores, infect the flowers, um, resulting in that scab. So uh, other factors to be thinking about is variety susceptibility. There are tremendous differences um, in varieties out there. So being aware of, of what you are growing is super important. And ideally, we don't want to plant wheat into corn residue because that um, increases the risk for head scab development. I pulled up the head scab risk tool and I'll be keeping an eye on this as we do virtual breakfasts. Um, you know, basically we're, we're too early, right? We're not flowering anyway, but this is what the current map is showing. So you can find this at, at this web address here. Um, so I will certainly look at this as we approach heading and keep an eye um, on how things are looking. I'm really concerned when we have a lot of red um, and we're flowering, you know, if it if it lines up with flowering, because that that indicates that you know we may be um, in for a, a bad year for a head scab development. So I'll keep an eye on that um, as we go through the season here. Um, just a quick reminder to um, sort of how quickly things happen. Right, we go from heading day zero, we begin flowering about two to four days post heading, um, and we want to think about fungicide applications for head scab management at that beginning of flowering. So when 50% of your heads out in the field there have anthers on them, 
that's when we're at that begin flowering window. And we have about a week from that begin flowering um, to the end to get our fungicides on for maximum um, head scab suppression. Timing is critical. So flowering starts um, in the middle of the head and moves to the top and then to the bottom um, of those wheat heads. So optimal control, if you really want to, you know, if you really have some control there, we've, we've seen when we look at multiple data sets, maybe the best um, suppression about four days post the beginning of flowering. Again, we've got about that, that week window there. And just a quick note for those that might be growing barley, um, that tends to be about four to six days post heading um, in barley for the optimal timing. Um, in terms of products for head scab management, um, the landscape has changed a lot over the last few years. Um, for a long time, we were really looking at Prasaro and Caramba as a couple of our sort of primary products with good, good um, efficacy um, against head scab. More recently, Syngenta released Miravis Ace, and that includes another mode of action um, within the mix there. Bayer has recently released a, a product, Prasaro Pro, building on Prasaro, and then BASF have Spherex. Um, and now that we've been through two to three years of testing these different products, we feel that they all provide um, quite good control um, of head scab. The only other thing I want to make a quick note on um, in terms of head scab control. Um, it's off label and do not go putting a fungicide on that controlled contains a strobilurin because a strobilurin, that's a group 11 fungicide, um, that can actually exacerbate the amount of mycotoxin um, that that head scab can um, result in. Uh, and here's some quick data just to show you what we tend to expect with these fungicides. So They'll certainly reduce the amount of head scab by, you know, 40 to 60%, maybe a little bit more at times um, compared to our non-treated checks here in red and our different products there. And then the, the, the vomitoxin, the DON, we see a similar level of response or a similar level of suppression, but you should realize that it's only a level of suppression. It's not complete control. So just because you've made that ideal timing um, with a good product does not mean you're going to eliminate um, head scab if it's a head scab year. But what we are doing is, is reducing the amount of mycotoxin um, contamination. So again, somewhere in the order of 40 to 60% is sort of typical uh, when we look across multiple trials. And then the other quick note, and I, I stole this slide from the Canadians. Um, we really want to think a little bit differently about head scab management. As best as possible, we basically want to paint the head, that wheat head, right? With uh, foliar applications, a flat fan nozzle is perfectly fine, straight down, no problem. But with head scab, we really want to try and protect that head. So anything you can do, uh, we typically use uh, twin jet nozzles that are angled to help maximize coverage as we're driving through. So something to, to think about. And then just finally, um, integrated head scab management. It always starts with resistant variety. So just be aware of the variety susceptibility that you might have out there. Those fungicide applications from flowering um, up into six days post flowering. Do not use strobilurins um, from heading on and ensure good coverage of the head. Rotation, of course, don't plant in a corn, ideally. And then we want to try and also manage for uniformity. I think one of the other things we struggle with is part of the field is flowering. The other part isn't anything we can do to, um, to, to manage for uniformity of the wheat stand. And, and that timing of flowering is helpful if we're going to try and put a fungicide on. Um, of course, best control of head scab comes through the incorporation of both variety resistance and fungicide. Um, that's critical if you really want to do a good job at trying to suppress um, head scab. And then don't forget about other diseases for, um, that could pop up. And uh, we'll keep an eye on things as, as things progress through the season and uh, keep you updated here on the virtual breakfast. Um, so with that, I'll um, hand it over to Jeff and we'll take some questions um, at the end. And oh, and also a quick thank you to Michigan Wheat um, in particular for supporting the work that we do. Great, thank you, Marty. Yeah, questions and answer period. 
All right, everyone, at this point in time, we are going to go into questions. So if you want to go ahead and submit those into the chat box, um, you're also welcome. If, if you would like to just ask, a, be unmuted, we have allowed you to do that. You could also you could also do that. So question. Yes, if you have a multiple wheat and you wanted to use that as a cover crop, would there be any disease issues the following year that you'd have to worry about? Like the head scab, the welts, etc. Yeah, so Clay, if I understand you correctly, you you're basically saying wheat on wheat then? It could be just let's say you had corn, you harvested your corn, you don't have any rye to put down, so you're gonna put down wheat just as a cover crop. You're gonna terminate it next spring. Yep. Are you gonna be worried about something the following right. fall if you were gotcha. gonna put wheat down? Because you'll put down dry beans that summer. Right. Okay, I got you. Thanks, Clay. Thanks for um clarifying. So um, I mean, we have been burnt on campus with wheat streak mosaic virus. Um, so whenever you're whenever you've got you know wheat on wheat, I would be worried about increased disease potential. Um, and in this case, we didn't terminate the previous wheat crop. It was actually in a neighboring field. So this is something else just to 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 think about. Um even in neighboring fields, you know, the potential impacts, right? So um, after wheat harvest, it's important that the wheat crop is completely terminated and those volunteers in the fall are taken out because we could see transmission of wheat streak mosaic virus from one field to the next. Um, in terms of your head scap risk, I think, honestly, I think the, the risk is reasonably minimal. It's, it's still there. Uh, it would be greater if you planted into corn residue, uh, just because corn residue makes it through the winter um, much more intact and is a much better um, structure for the, the fusarium to, to release spores from. Um, that fusarium fungus, unfortunately, can infect dry bean and soybean roots, so it doesn't matter too much what you do. You can't completely get away from it. But um, I think, yeah, I mean, in short, there is some increased risk, but I, I would be more worried about viral diseases, um, things like that, if it wasn't terminated properly once you were done with the wheat cover. I also included <clears throat> a wheat on wheat article that has been published before. And um, Dennis was a main contributor to that. Dennis, did you have anything you wanted to add or subtract or... <laughs> No, no, I think uh, Marty covered that very well. Okay. Did you have an update in general about wheat that you would like to give? Um, just as an update, uh, we've been traveling around to our research trial locations uh, scattered across the state. And despite the cool weather we've had, uh, wheat is still growing and, and starting to advance through some of the growth stages. So we have wheat at FEEC 6 at all of our trial locations. We have some FEEC 7 in some of our early varieties uh, in Monroe County. Uh, so, you know, everybody thinks that the wheat is kind of stalled, but uh, it, it really is still growing. But overall, the crop looks like some of the best wheat crop I think we've seen in the state of Michigan in a long, long time. And that's what growers are reporting to me, agronomists are reporting to me as well, is that they can't believe that it looks as good as it does. And, you know, in terms of yield potential, the slow growth, in the spring actually does contribute to higher yields. Um, so we'll have to see what the weather does between now and you know flowering and then during the grain fill period. But yeah, I think we're set up with the base for the crop to have really good yields this year. Awesome. And if people are curious about wheat development and conditions, there are the, uh, the wheat watchers. Um, so there's people throughout the state that uh, submit a survey weekly, kind of giving an update on that. And uh, you can view that as an article, the reports every week and the digest, the field crops digest. And so the first one should be coming out this week, as long as I get the edits in. So you're, you're waiting on me. <laughs> but yeah. 
Um, next question coming in. Do you see that, Marty? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yep. No <laughs> problem. Is, uh, yeah, one from um, Dave. So it's a question about Rust. I guess I'm still trying to understand what that question is about. So I think he was seeing Rust in the fall. Um, does this have to be treated in the fall? Um, I've never heard of a Rust treatment in the fall. Um, I would be really curious to have a look at that. We should definitely make sure that we've got that correctly diagnosed. Um, yeah, I mean, typically to the Rust, our, our general consensus is that Rust doesn't overwinter for the most part um, up here. There, there is some potential, you know, other considerations on that. And, and there's been a little bit of um, debate, I guess, but in, in general, it, we the ones that we're really concerned about are those that are moving up from, from the south. Um, re well, reddish yellowing of the wheat, I would be more concerned with uh, viruses. So I would get some samples into the MSU Diagnostic Clinic, and this is a really good plug for that, actually. So the yeah. wheat, uh, wheat program is supporting the submission of samples to the Diagnostic Clinic. Um, that's a fantastic service. I would really urge you to get some samples of that or any of you, if you think you've got, you're just not 100% sure, right? Like in this case, this is a great example. Just get some samples submitted. They can run some virus testing. Um, there's a number of different things, Aster yellows, wheat streak mosaic virus. There's, there's a number of different things that, that could be an issue. Um, so we want to get on top of that and, and have a better understanding. Uh, at some point, I'd like to launch a larger virus survey across the state, but that might be next year can't do everything at once, unfortunately. Yeah, I went ahead and pasted, it is a, a perk to the farmers that are producing wheat to use the diagnostic uh, clinic. And so I went ahead and pasted the link in on our Michigan Wheat Commodity Group that provides that. So please, and then if you have questions about like grabbing samples or help with that, of course, you've got Marty, but um, Dennis, myself, and then Jenna Failer are also like the wheat team that you're welcome to reach out to and we'd be happy to help. Yeah. All right. Anthony Scotty's. Yes, he and does. Anthony, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Um, I could just continue with um, Dave's question yeah. too. So Dave is asking, most diseases don't overwinter? Well, it depends. So if it's a rust, the, so rust require um, living tissue and for the most part that doesn't tend to happen over the winter a, a great deal. Um, other things like septoria, um, other, fungal, uh, other fungal diseases can certainly overwinter, absolutely. Um, and they overwinter in the region, even on um, dead debris and can release spores from that dead debris. But the rust has to be basically releasing spores from living green tissue. And that's why it doesn't tend to overwinter. It basically retreats um, every winter back back to the south. All and right. vi yeah, viruses will also obviously uh, reside within that that wheat um, over the winter. All right. Any other questions or comments or any other specialists on that would like to also give a little update? I was going to mention. I don't know if Chris Defonzo is on, but we've been trapping. And so you can get on and take a look at um, the trapping uh, map. Actually, I can go ahead and paste that in. And um, I've had some black cutworm nearing like 30 per trap. So there was a little tick up with this last storm that came through. Um, but nothing besides that. Things are, are looking uh, pretty good out there. Okay, another disease question for Marty. Yeah, so cephalosporium, um, I don't have as much experience working with that, but that's going to come back to wheat variety. Um, so again, you know, if there's a particular issue, if you're always dealing with head scab um, or always you know, dealing with a particular issue, go back and think about the varieties, have a look at the varieties you are growing. So for cephalosporium, I would certainly start with um, variety as a management tool. And that may be one of the, the primary management tools for cephalosporium. Right. Oh, Chris, you are on, Chris Stefanzo. Do you mind anything you'd like to say? Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can. Hey, okay, I'm on a different thing here. Yeah, my numbers are really low. Like I got one black cutworm in each of my traps and one army worm. So it was very low. But again, when you hit that little sweet spot, you know, from maybe a little a little shower or something, and they kind of get rained out. You know, you can have a you can have higher numbers. There was a big a big wad of them just uh, south in Indiana a, co a couple weeks ago. Uh, I forgot which uh, which county that that was. I don't have my Indiana map. Maybe Lake County or something. So that would be in the like our southwest corner. But I haven't heard anything. I mean, I there's awful lot of awful lot of weeds out there in some of these fields. So if they're there, they're feeding happily on something right right now so okay would you say the 30-ish i caught is that a is that a concern like should my growers be out uh, so a concern is like if you get uh, a, a heavy catch is like nine in a given night so i mean maybe you had one night there where there was nine but i mean if you look at the purdue trap sometimes there's hundreds mm -hmm. so that's a much more concerning sort of thing yep. again you just have to go out there and look because they're they're patchy, you know, and so one person may have them and then your field the county over doesn't. So it's the boots on the ground kind of walking in a, in a couple of weeks to see signs of something going haywire. All right. Any other questions? I don't see many other specialists on to give like a little updates. So. Monica, just one other thing on Seth's Aquarium. Uh, we did uh, rate our variety trials uh, two years ago. So if you go to our report from 21, there is variety ratings on cephalosporium. I've already mentioned it. Um, that's going to be pretty highly uh, variety specific. So um, we don't always get an infection to the rate or to the level that we can rate varieties, but we did in that year. So um, if you're interested, go look at that uh, variety trial result. All right. And I guess we might as well put a plug in, too, for the field days, the wheat field days coming up. If you wanted to come out and see some different varieties, um, speak with Eric, uh, our breeder. Uh, we have May 23rd is the field day that's going to be out at Hauk Seed Farm around Mount Pleasant, Michigan. It's very Googleable. You Google Hauk, H-A-U-C-K, Seed Farm. Um, it will pop up. And then the one on the 25th, Dennis, can you remind me, where's that one? Uh, Kilmana, up on the thumb. It's uh, northeast of Seaboing. Okay. Both of those have um, research trials that Dennis is doing out there. So we can look at the research, but then we can also have a general discussion about management issues. And please bring some wheat, diseased wheat or any issues so Dennis can uh, take a look at it. He'll be there and can do run a little <clears throat> diagnostic clinic. Okay, I think I haven't seen any other questions come in. I wanna thank Marty and Jeff for getting on and presenting um, this morning. We really appreciate it. And uh, I uh, just wanna say thank you to all of you for getting on. You kinda are the reason we produce this stuff. So thank you for attending and we hope to see you next week.